kick things off. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to uh, the Barnes Philosophy Club's November talk. And this is part of our uh, ongoing season, uh, wide in scope and ambition to tackle consciousness, technology and psychology. It's what we're dealing with uh, this year. Uh, we're still going very, very well. And we are delighted to have today uh, a long-standing and extremely active and committed club member, uh, Paul Fletcher. He's uh, actually so committed that he's been instrumental in booking a lot of the speakers uh, that we have uh, this season, including our next one, um, which we will talk a little bit at the end uh, about Trish Glazebrook. Um, and Paul has agreed to come and share some of his thoughts actually on uh, the information overload, the multiplication of sources uh, of information and news that we increasingly deal with as technology expands and becomes ever more present in our, in our lives. I'm standing in the wrong place. <laughs> You'll need to stand up if you want to say something cool. Um, so we're going to have a slightly unusual format this time. We're experimenting with different formats, see how they work for uh, our live audience, our online audience. You can see uh, peeping over the top of the, the screen there, um, and uh, also our speakers. And so this time, uh, what we're going to do is play actually a, a video uh, of the talk. So. Paul is going to have the surreal experience of watching himself speak, which I think is very, very appropriate for our for our season. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Paul a few questions just to kick things off. And then we will throw it open for all of you and perhaps even uh, our online guests as well through the chat function. I think many of them have got the hang of that already. Uh, so we can have a bit of a, a debate about it. Um, I have a couple of notices I want to share before we hand over to Paul. And we might ask you, Paul, just to briefly introduce the video. Um, the first is to say that our last talk, which was on Nietzsche and self-consciousness, is now available on YouTube. Um, so do watch that if you haven't already. Um, I think YouTube's servers will be able to cope even if you all go to watch it after the meeting. So don't worry about spacing things out. Um, and then the second is that we have our very first, uh, possibly last, we'll see, publication uh, from the Barnes Philosophy Club. Um, I think some of you were at our July birthday party, our 10th birthday, uh, where we talked about you know what counts as philosophy. And we had uh, contributions from our chair emerita who's joined us in person today thank you in person today thank you barbie uh, and also from some very long-standing uh, friends and supporters of the club uh, philosophers from around the country uh, who all um, gave speeches about what in their view counts as philosophy uh, and then we had some drinks and we have immortalized Perhaps that's a strong word for a paperback. We have uh, embodied uh, the event in a publication, and we have just a few hard copies. Uh, so I wanted to present the very first one uh, to Barbie in person. And great to see you here with us today, Barbie. Um, so I, I will uh, shortly be putting up, I think, a, a sort of download for people who want uh, to get hold of the publication and relive those heady summer days uh, discussing philosophy. Um, but I will also put up instructions. If you, if you would like me to post you a, a hard copy, um, I can do that, providing my supply uh, lasts. So I'll send out an email with all the details. Uh, okay, I think that's all I've got. Over to you, Paul, to introduce the topic. 
Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here tonight. I'd like to thank everybody for turning out. I'd like to especially thank Nick for helping to organise it all. I'd like to, of course, thank Barbie and Simeon for making a great public appearance here, which is fantastic. And also my friend Freya helped out with me trying to keep me sane while I've been trying to do this, which has been quite a task. Um, tonight's, first of all, we're going to have a, a little video that I made of the slideshow, which makes it a bit easier than, than me just trying to talk to you. Then we're gonna have a little session with Nick, little interview, then I'm gonna take some of the questions hopefully from the floor. What the talk is about, I've been um, concerned with language and how it's used on the internet, how it's used to uh, entice us, cajole us and control us. And I was quite, I became quite besotted with it, sort of like the epistemology of language and argumentative theory and how that can be linked to how the internet actually works and how we use it. And then thinking about that, I thought, well, how can we get philosophy to help us out when we look at things on the internet as well? So there's gonna be start off with a little thing about argumentative theory, which will, uh, which will go down why we may want to go on to the internet. Then it's gonna go on to Miranda Fricker, who is a very prominent epistemologist and he'll go through uh, credibility deficit and credibility access, which will be all explained on here. And then we're gonna wrap it up with a little bit about how, we, how, how that actually works with a couple of examples. And then conclusion will be some of the ideas from namely John Stuart Mill on how we can interpret knowledge that we get from the internet and what might prevent us from clicking on that little mouse button when we shouldn't do really. So I hope you enjoy it and uh, uh, let's begin. Thank you. So we retreat. So we will retreat like backwards and want the soul from the stage. Can so much information be dangerous or even fatal? This is a talk by Paul Fletcher on the 9th of November 2021 for Barnes Philosophy Club, supported by the Royal philosophy. In this talk, I'm going to be looking at how we interpret information and knowledge from the internet. Too little information, a credibility deficit, as well as too much information, a credibility excess, can each pose a series of problems. I hope you will take away some different ways you can look at the information from the internet in the future, which may give you pause for thought before committing to clicking and buying into ideas, ideologies, and theories. Hopefully, over the next 35 minutes or so, I'll provide you with some of the strategies to help you navigate through the myriad of information on the web. A little learning is a dangerous thing, is taken from Alexander Pope's poem and essay on criticism published in 1711, when Pope was around 22 years old. In our daily lives, we can be confronted with a plethora of information. In a tidal wave of images and sounds, we can feel drowned in memes, adverts, news, titillation, speculation, thoughts and views for the good, bad and the ugly. Amongst all the good the web throws up at us, the lack of filters and fact checkers can lead to confusion and misinformation, which can spread lies around the world before the truth has even got its trousers on. How we ingest and digest the flood of information, separate the wheat from the chaff, is becoming more and more complicated. People can easily be drawn into falsehoods and find affirmation of misinformation from cherry-picking studies not legitimately peer-reviewed. This can be from television, the internet, and newspapers. This can feed alternative facts and nourish falsehoods. I will begin by having a quick run through six types of dialogue. The examples here are what we might be engaging in and with when we got on the internet. The net has changed the way we look at information as we can look at testimony from the written 
and spoken world while watching images all at the same time. We do sometimes have an epistemic dependency on others as they possess epistemic skills and experience on the subject we need to inquire about. I will be looking at an example of epistemic dependency in an example later on in this talk. I will then move on to Miranda Flicker's idea around credibility excess and credibility deficit from her 2007 book, Epistemic Injustice. Credibility excess and deficit is how we judge or rate a person for the information they give us. In this talk, I want you to think about how this is applied to the internet. I will give examples which outline the idea and change the perception and shape of a topic. Dialogue concerning epistemic skills, epistemic dependence and experience are very important and sought after, but we live in an age where experts are sometimes disregarded. Epistemic enthusiasts are totally disregard for information which challenges ideas held by a person or agent. I will be comparing epistemic insidious with lying, as I earlier mentioned, later on in this talk. Conspiracy theories are rife with fallacies, which are also part and part of sections of our society's infatuation with dissent. The purposeful misleading of one's beliefs and ideas and the link with action resulting from them will also be touched upon. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but the questions are certainly worth thinking about. So sit back, make yourself comfortable and get ready for a good old thing. with six types of dialogue, justice, looking into credibility excess and credibility deficit. Then we have the depth of expertise, how credibility excess and deficit can be misattributed and misused on the internet. Improved by seeing how philosophy can help us with credibility, excess, and deficit with our interactions online. Before we get into it, here is Festina Lente from a book of Argyzes by Erasmus, published around 1500. This collection reminded me of memes and sayings we often see on the internet. The dolphin and the anchor signified that we ought to make it slowly take our time. Erasmus took this illustration and saying from August Minutius while he was talking to a group of students. Minutius invented a movable typeset for the Greek language and was the first person to print Plato's works. The printing press was a way of producing books and pamphlets which contained unregulated information, which some considered dangerous, like some of the pages, means and information on the internet today. So nothing is completely without provenance and heritage. So I hope to make haste slowly to this talk. I will now swiftly take you through six types of dialogue from what's called an argument theory. It is important that we set out the crucial reasoning of why we engage with the internet. So I've taken the fundamental categories here, which will be relevant later throughout the talk. The first is persuasion. The initial situation is conflict of opinions. The participant's goal is to persuade the party. And the goal of the dialogue is to resolve or clarify issues. Inquiry, which is the need to have proof, find and verify evidence, prove or disprove evidence. Negotiation, which is a conflict of opinions, to get what you most want and achieve a reasonable settlement that both can live with. 
Information seeking is a need of information to acquire or give information, and the goal of the dialogue here is an exchange of information. Deliberation involves dilemma or personal choice to coordinate goals and decide the best available course of action. And an heuristic type of dialogue, a heuristic comes from the goddess of disco Lewis, and this involves personal conflict to verbally hit out as an opponent, and this can reveal a deeper basis of conflict. This type of dialogue is probably best represented by personal attack, by homing on people, which has become part and parcel of the internet's disregard for reasonable and respectful treatment of communication between people. We live in an age of reason. Well, this is David Hume's take on that. We now glide toward the idea of credibility access and credibility deficit. Rand the Fricker coined this phrase of epistemic injustice in 2007. And here we see the two types of epistemic injustice, testimonial and hermeneutical. Credibility excess and deficit in this talk leans more towards testimonial injustice. Although how one deals with a prejudice can influence how we can judge situations for the good and not so good outcomes by missing out on a piece of knowledge. Either the prejudice results in the speaker receiving more credibility than she would otherwise have, the credibility excess, or it results in her receiving less credibility than she would otherwise have, a credibility deficit. So the idea is that the prejudice will tend surreptitiously to inflate or deflate the credibility afforded to the speaker. And sometimes it will be sufficient to cross the threshold for belief or acceptance so that the hearer's prejudice causes him or her to miss out on a piece of knowledge. People can experience or get different information and messages from the same situation. The reason why for the difference of opinion can be many depending on the individual's knowledge, critical thinking, ability, and biases. My purpose here is to touch upon two examples to illustrate this. Our first example asks us to consider an overburdened GP. With patients asking medical questions that call for a more special training. He is not in a position to answer them fully responsibly, yet he must do his best to answer them since his patients need an answer and he is the only source they have access to. If patients assume that he is in a position to provide the information they need and thus they attribute to him an excess of credibility on the matters in question. Let us add that any attempts to disabuse them of their inflated view of its expertise would damage the doctor patient relationship by unduly undermining their confidence in him. All this is an ethical burden for our GP because he is aware that his best advice might yet mislead them about an important health issue. For this GP, the credibility access he receives from his patients brings an unwanted ethical burden. And so we can see that credibility access can be disadvantageous. Here we see the problem of how credibility access and deficit can lead to a prejudicial or unintended outcome. Example two illustrates our credibility deficit and transform itself into credibility excess. This example is also a perfect blend of how lying and epistemic insouciance, which we will be looking into later, can exist side by side. The Marshall Mitchell effect is when a psychiatrist, psychologist, or mental health clinician diagnoses a person with a mental illness involving all 
such as delusions or paranoia, despite the fact that the person is simply describing things that are factually true, but the clinician believes otherwise. Mitchell's claim that high-level White House officials have conspired to commit crimes and keep them from the American people have many elements of conspiracy theories. This led high-level officials to speculate that she suffered from mental illness. Ultimately, however, when the facts of Watergate came into light, it was clear that Mitchell was correct. She was threatened, physically abused, and possibly kidnapped in an attempt to keep her from spreading information about Watergate with others. Here we see how credibility deficits can move into gaslighting, but the truth can lead to a type of credibility excess. My opinion is just as good as your knowledge. This is a quote from Isaac Asimov. Each person's opinion about anything must be accepted as equal to anyone else's. That a solipsistic and thin skinned insistence that every opinion should be treated as truth, and an insistence that strongly held opinions are indistinguishable from facts. Even after the two examples given, we have a problem, especially on the internet, that at the root of all this, an inability among lay people to understand that experts can be wrong on occasion about certain issues is not the same thing as experts being consistently wrong on everything. The fact of the matter is that experts are more often than not right, especially on matters of fact. And yet the public constantly searches for the loopholes of expert knowledge, which will allow them to disregard all expert advice they don't like, an example of epistemic enthusiasm. Carl Sagan famously said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So we are required to look at the difference between lying and epistemic enthusiasm, a term first introduced to me by the philosopher Kassim Kassam. This explains why being epistemically insouciant is not the same as being a liar. Lying is something that a person does rather than an attitude, and the intention to conceal the truth implies that the liar is not indifferent to the truth or falsity of his utterances. Epistemic insouciance is an attitude rather than something that a person does, and it does imply an indifference <coughs> To the truth or falsity of what utterances. For the liar, as well as the truth teller, the speaker must understand a verbal act as the kind of thing that she herself could understand and accept as a reason to believe something. Epistemic insouciance means not really caring much about any of this and being excessively casual and nonchalant about the challenge of finding answers to complex questions, partly as a result of a tendency to view such questions as much less complex as they really are. It is impossible for someone to lie unless he thinks he knows the truth. A person who lies is thereby responding to the truth, and he is, to that extent, respectful of it. When an honest man speaks, he says only what he believes to be true. And for the liar, it is correspondingly indispensable that he considers his statements to be false. Epistemic insouciance means viewing the need to find evidence in support of one's views as a mere inconvenience, as something that is not to be taken too seriously. Finding accurate answers to complex questions can be hard work, and epistemic insouciance makes that hard work seem unnecessary. The epistemically insouciant inquires, quite his attitude is that hard work is for suckers. Mm -hmm. I will now just briefly summarize the points here. The lie has to be more plausible to some degree as the truth. Although a smoking 
executive, and this is important, said once we are in the business of doubt. So taking all this into account, we need not categorically point out statements or premises that are invalid or unsound. We merely have to instill a modicum or a very small amount of doubt to cause mayhem. I have coined my own term for this, and it's called trickle down mendacity, which is going to be a subject of a forthcoming paper. And it's how when somebody in a position of power or influence, when they lie, this can have a trickle down effect or other people thinking perfectly okay to lie or not be truthful as well. We have looked at ways in which we can form opinions via the basic six dialogue types of argument theory and how we can view opinions that are either favorable or less than favorable by a credibility excess or credibility deficit. We then looked at how people who are experts can be discredited and how people with little information can be seen to be incredible. This has different aspects to it. One, naivety. The speaker is considered plausible because the hearer has not considered if the speaker is wrong. And this can be due to the speaker using rhetoric very persuasively. Here we have a quote from Aristotle and the art of rhetoric. Maxims give great assistance to speeches, for one thing, to the stupidity of the listeners. For they are delighted with someone in generalizing to the rise of opinions they hold in a political case. A rather harsh statement there from Aristotle, but a true one. The information echoes or affirms a confirmation bias or even an unconscious bias, then we must remember Kant's wise words here. There is therefore only one categorical imperative. It is act only according to that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So here we're basically saying, imagine what would happen if everybody was subject to epistemic insouciance or lying, or dominated by either credibility excess or credibility deficit. And the examples we have gone through in this talk illustrate why Kant's words here are very important and relative. The hearer becomes part of an echo chamber. Now, I don't wish to go into echo chambers here because one of our scheduled speakers for next year, Jennifer Lackey, has done some brilliant work regarding echo chambers. But here we see the brilliant Anna event, and this quote is taken from the origins of totalitarianism. Only the mob and the elite can be attracted by the momentum of totalitarianism itself. The masses have to be won by propaganda. Under conditions of constitutional government and freedom of opinion, totalitarian movements struggling for power can use terror to a limited extent only and share with other parties the necessity of winning adherence and of appearing plausible to a public which is not yet rigorously isolated from all other sources of information. New information is treated by the group or a spokesperson in the group with epistemic enthusiasm, a flat refusal to believe any challenging information. And here's Anna Ravant again. Before mass leaders see the power to fit reality to the lie, the propaganda is marked by its extreme content of facts. And so, for in their opinion, fact depends entirely, entirely on the power of man who can fabricate it. Quite relevant at the moment. We are all susceptible 
to be due. No matter how savvy, well educated, or street smart we think we are. So I'm going to move on to a guide to help you think before you click on that tempting offer you can't refuse or group you feel compelled to subscribe to. There are experts and gurus, people who we should defer entirely. There are fakes and fools who should be ignored. In between, there are friends and other advisors, including our own future and past selves, whose opinions should guide us in a less than fully authoritative way. If in doubt, we can always turn to John Stuart Mill for help. I found that John Stuart Mill's argument Freedom can come in very handy when looking at information on the internet. Um, there is the fallibility argument, but we see somebody who never confesses to making any mistakes, or is always right. Um, this can involve episodic enthusiasm when you challenge them, or even lying about things. So always be aware of people who always say they're right. We then move on to the dead dog, dog, dead dog argument, dead dogma argument, rather. And this uh, involves claiming that views that are unchallenged will lose our capacity to provide good reasons in their defense and they will be held dogmatically. Beware of the power of three, either that being a phrase that is divided up into a three or three words. Um, for it, Collins spoke a little bit about this when he came to the club, uh, I think last year. We then move on to the partly true argument. And, um, and this really deals with views, uh, which are for the most part full, but they contain elements of truth that may be lost if the views are suppressed. Beware of the phrase, the reality is, as more often than not, a series of dubious claims usually comes immediately after this is uttered. A link with action is that all challenge views, even if it's true, laws that lose their power to stir people into action. Think at the moment the environment protesters and certain political shenanigans can affirm this argument. Truth by authority. Now, this is an offshoot of the fallibility argument, but I included this because it has become the bread and butter for some of the internet. Internet broadcasters or influencers, as they are called on YouTube, can not only make money from popularism, popularism their web pages, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, TikTok channels, can be very lucrative. In fact, some of them earn up to six and seven bigger sums for their media output, their social media output. And offshoot businesses can get subscribers, patrons, and they can profit from views and clicks. And as an addition to this, it can be quite alarming how people who have extreme views or are towards the right of politics can actually be more popular than people who have centrist or left of centre views. We can see examples of this of YouTube of people who get over a million subscribers and have videos that have over a million views or hundreds of thousands of views. And that can be quite worrying um, because we, as we say, as you said earlier, we live in an age of unreason. Now, we would think that people or the youth, it's always proclaimed that the youth will change everything, will have more critical thinking, will be more aware. Well, that may not be the case. And certainly looking at how popular some of the influencers and people on TikTok 
a Facebook and YouTube and Twitch are, my view is it's not pointing towards that very convincingly that people will be more reasonable in the future. <laughs> and here, for the benefit of people who are seriously into deep philosophy, we have first order evidence and high order evidence. This is the motivation for a steadfast step back view of peer disagreements has been thought to come from the distinction between first order evidence and high order evidence. First order evidence regarding a proposition is evidence directly pertaining to that position. So in other words, somebody will present some evidence, either probably a paper, and they will say, this is the evidence that proved my proposition or premises. Now, High order evidence is regarding the proposition is about the evidence about the evidence pertaining to that proposition. I did say this was deep philosophy, I didn't warn you. So what you have, you don't look at the evidence, you look at the process of how that evidence was accumulated through other, other evidence to get to that position. That one way of looking at it. This is a deep subject, and again, I cite Jennifer Lackey, who has written about this as well. So this is just a little bit of thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking about evidence. I hope this talk has given you some food for thought to Jack. Question. I like to think of philosophy as not telling you how to think, but allowing you to think. And what makes philosophy effective is that we can play with ideas. And that's not looking at it flippantly, but or like a child, it's having that childlike curiosity. Which we sometimes lose if we get older, as we have to deal with the responsibilities that come our way as we do get older. So it's good to have a chance to play with ideas. And I am looking forward to the question and answer section of this talk. With Pascal, he of Pascal's wager. So we have to be aware that sometimes we read, hear, and see things on the internet that may cause what I call epistemic ingestion. We may not be able to swallow the fact that it was true or false as well as we would like to. And questioning is very effective, as I've said in the previous slide. But here, Pascal says, people are generally better persuaded by the reasons which they have themselves discovered than by those which have come to the mind of others. Now, this is kind of like contradictory in some respects to what I have said, because people indulge in internet searches or refer to Dr. Google. And what the internet reminds me of is that I'm old enough to remember this, is that my parents and my nan and granddad had a copy of a book called The Home Doctor. And Dr. Google can be responsible for the same type of thing that you found there. Is that they used to refer to the Home Doctor book when they were ill and suddenly discovered that they, while living like I was, we were in Rotherham in South Yorkshire, that they had convinced themselves that they have got a rare tropical disease. <laughs> so we need to be careful because this now has changed. So the reason in which we look at things can be influenced by others for the good and for the bad. And we can reach some very good conclusions, but also some very strange conclusions that we then wrap in epistemic insouciance. 
We also can look at things on the internet and feel it's a waste of time. And here's William Shakespeare. I wasted time, and now don't time waste none. Even Yorick has an opinion on this. I'd like to thank you all for listening to this talk. But before we go into the question and answer section and uh, interview with Nick Aldridge, which I'm looking forward to, I'm going to ask you to take your time. Now, here is a bridge in Sarajevo, Bosnia. And as you can see, it's a bridge that's got a, like a little twist in the middle of the loop, and you can see seeds on there. For those of you who can remember, earlier on, I talked about um, Adar by Erasmus with a dolphin in an anchor. This bridge is called Festina Lente Bridge. And you can sit on this bridge and pond the line. So remember online at all times, Festina Lente. And make haste slow. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Thank you to the audience for the, the very generous round of applause there. I'm going to check that, um, Robin, can they see us in our full glory here? Robin, uh, thank you. And Paul, do come up and, and join me. Uh, perhaps you want to sitting, Robin, do you? You're about to learn a somewhat unethical way to keep your own yeah. uh, I think that's the next video, which we might not want to watch. <laughs> that's not me, but Right now, answer this question as honestly as you can. Shall we try it? You love doing it. Your answer is yes, and that's bad news. Right, well, we have the next talk lined up. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, thank you very much uh, to Paul and to the audience for the, the generous round of applause. I feel like Robin also deserves a round of applause because every month we come up with an even more complicated format for him to organize with the ASOS technology and he hasn't failed yet. So we'll have a more difficult task next month. Next, next, next time we'll get a better uh, picture. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. But thank you very much, Robin. I was um, listening to your, your fascinating talk, Paul, and thinking about your advice to people not to get involved in joining dubious groups online and then getting into discussions that lead them to strange conclusions. Sitting here in the Barnes Philosophy Club, I wondered if you were sort of wandering a bit off our, off our public message there. Do you want to rethink that advice at all? Well, I, I think that online, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to um, be drawn into certain sites because it's down to the old algorithms again. When you go onto the internet, whatever you type in, you could type, if you want to try it, you could type pink flip-flops in, and you'll be amazed how many times pink flip-flop comes up on your phone, your iPad, and everything else. So you really need to be very careful what you even look at, especially if you sign up to something, because not only that, you can have people, even if you join a not a society like this, of course, which is all free thinking and decent people. Um, you can get drawn into like a little clique of a club. And even if you start questioning them in a very subtle way, you can have a, like a tidal ways of abuse and trolling and things like that. So you, you do have to be careful sometimes online. And you've just had the very strange experience of watching yourself give a talk online so i hope that was okay for you is there anything that you wish you had added or that you would like to add before i ask you a few questions well i wish it had adjusted the sound at the beginning because it sounded like i was beginning to shout every single line it got everybody's attention 
It was quite a good technique, actually, because I could see a few people nodding off. And then <laughs> they kept doing that as well. So it was quite a good little device to have. So I advise that. I'm quite impressed with that, you know, because people forgot I was at the back, you know. That's very much the approach we take to audio technology here uh, at the events as well. Um, one, one thing you touched on a few times is you know, the question of what sort of inquiry people are engaged in or you know what are they engaged in an inquiry at all and something my uh old philosophy professor used to say although he wasn't that old decades ago when i was studying philosophy uh, was that the mark of a successful day is one where you have your pre-existing views confirmed so by, by that token, any, any sort of challenge or anything that forces you to rethink your view is a bit of a, you know, unpleasant experience, a bit of a defeat. And you, you mentioned um, Professor Lackey, a future speaker of the Barnes Philosophy Club and her work on echo chambers. And, you know, to what extent do you think people online are actually looking to learn anything new versus just have their views confirmed as much as possible? Well, um, I think regarding your professor, there's another very famous line that says the, the secret to su success is sincerity. And if you can fake that, you've got it made, which is another kind of, sort of line you can have. The, um, the, the thing is with echo chambers and um, how people are drawn into them, it's very, it's intriguing um, because you're just surrounding yourself with people who've got the same, the same opinions as you. And that can be very affirming. And I think one of the reasons why people are drawn into gossip and things like that is it's quite easy to do. And the other point is about it is that some people actually are addicted to it and get like a dopamine release from it. They get a lot of pleasure from hearing gossip about either prime ministers, ministers or secretaries or whatever. So it becomes quite ad addictive. And there are people who, are, who, are, who will tweet about absolutely anything and take a, I'm always quite amazed about people taking photos of the breakfast, dinner and tea and everything and putting it on there as if it had some like philosophical value, you know, well, unless it got hemlock or afterwards he may do. But that's what kind of amazes me on there. I just wanted to check on the sound. Is Paul coming through loud enough at the back? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. I usually haven't got a problem with my voice carrying, <laughs> Nick. It's usually one of the last things. People actually tell me to shut up usually, not the other way around. Very well. Certainly not telling you to shut up at this stage. Uh, we'll, we'll have another, I think, 10 minutes or so of of questions from me and then we'll open it up so do start thinking if there's well hopefully you've been thinking throughout but yeah. start thinking particularly if there's something you'd like to uh ask and i think we might even allow short statements and contributions as well as questions we'll see we'll give that a go for the first few minutes and then see if we need to rapidly you rethink. didn't mention that at all you've just dropped that on me now <laughs> well, that should make it easier for you. Just the look you gave me when you said that, a look of approval, <laughs> and I had this look of fear. Yeah, yeah, looking for affirmation and got terror. Yeah, that's fine. Um, another sort of element of you know, people's experience of engaging in debate and inquiry, and you know, we're talking this season about concepts in in psychology, uh, and one you know significant work on psychology and thinking was Daniel Kahneman's book thinking fast and slow which I, I think you've you've come across and he, he talks about it's you know, sort of system one thinking which is where you react very quickly and you get a sense of something and you intuitively know whether it feels like the right sort of thing or the the wrong sort of thing um, and system two thinking which is where you sort of pause and you're forced to actually work it out painstakingly so if i say three times three equals nine everyone well probably everyone will have a sort of quick yeah that sounds that sounds about right sort of thing whereas if i say well 17 times 24 
then most of you will have a sort of, oh no, I'm going to have to <laughs> you know, engage system two and painfully work this out. And I might even need to borrow a piece of paper from, from Nick at the front. And I wonder if it's the same sort of thing happens online. You know, we glide very quickly past anything that causes us to have to think hard and we alight very quickly on anything that sort of sounds about right and confirms our prejudices. And does this mean that, you know, in the nicest possible way, people like you, Paul, people like us who are trying to encourage rational debate and for people to think things through are a bit doomed when it comes to the internet and communication there? Yeah. Yeah, well, okay. the, that's it. You know. No, there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of like, yeah, there's a futility about it, but that should mean that you should stop, you know, trying to at least, you, you don't need to go, <clears throat> as I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned in the talk, you don't need to go full on with somebody who, who, you, who you disagree with, say with, take an extreme example, and a, a, a conspiracy theorist. You don't need to go on full on with them straight away because they've already prepared for that. If you introduce a little, little tinsy wincy bit of doubt, so you have to be charitable, a little bit magnanimous with people, and then just introduce a little bit of doubt, or look at, like we said in the last video, the, the higher order evidence, but be very subtle about it. Because everybody's used to this idea of people just being absolutely against each other. And what happens is, is that when you go into that kind of quagmire of just contradiction in everything, it gets had hominin very quickly. And the other thing about uh, Kahneman's work is that between the first, um, it system one and system two, isn't it? System one and system two. One of the things that, that it doesn't take into account of is memory very much. So you may go online and you may have, you've got episodic memory, short-term, long-term memory, memory, and semantic memory. Now, it doesn't work all the time your memory and things like that. You can't recall things all the time. So sometimes it's very difficult to look at something and be absolutely critical about it because you've got an image, you've got language, you've got rhetoric flying at you everywhere. And it can be very tempting and very seductive until you actually look at it and you have to go, hang on a minute, this is, I, I'm one of those people who goes, always goes, Faye will tell you, I always go, hang on a minute, that's not quite right, or hang on a minute, you know even when I'm in a shop, you know, buying butter, hang on, that's not quite right. Um, and so I think that they, even though it's very good with um, uh, with Kahneman, there are some people as well who've disputed this, the Dunning-Kruger effect that he had. There are some people who have said, well, it doesn't take into account the certain issues about, about how people are and things like that. And also they've got with... Um, don't know if you want me to talk about new technology yet or you want to wait for questions well um i don't know did anybody listen to the digital human on radio 4 last night anybody it's a very popular show obviously um well <laughs> they may do now yeah well well some of you may have heard of a chap called paul ekman anybody hear about him he did a lot on facial recognition in the 70s and he went off to some I think he went to some tribe somewhere in Africa and studied facial recognition and come up with a whole theory about namely micro expressions and emotions that were universal. Now, this has been hotly contested and I didn't really know about this till last night. So this is brand new. And what the problem is for computers and AI is for them to actually recognize facial expressions and rec recognize emotions. It's a real problem for it at the moment. And how that develops is gonna be very interesting. So I was quite amazed that this thing that I thought had quite a lot of substance to it, while at nine o'clock when I just completed all my talk and all my notes, I found out it was a complete load of rubbish. So it was absolutely fantastic for me, a revelation. But uh, the digital human, I listen to it, it's very interesting. It goes into douche and the douche and smile and all the all the kind of weird experiments that were done on people's faces to get emotion. And then it tells you how the computer industry, the technology industry, is really relying on old science that is not quite correct 
to set up new system yeah, systems in China on facial recognition, and they're trying to do it across here, and it's not quite working out as planned. Mm -hmm. Judging by all the uh, endless telling my computer what's a fire hydrant and what's a bus and what's a traffic light, I have to do every time I use a website. There are also even more <laughs> I, I simple to, problems that I was trying to solve. I had to tell mine what a printer was, and it was next to it <laughs> several times. Um, the the Dunning Kruger effect you you mentioned is is relevant here. Do you want to explain that, or should I explain? You explain first. You I'll explain, then you can comment. <laughs> So the, the Dunning Kruger effect is uh, there, there may be greater experts on this uh, than than I am. So raise your hand if you if you want to uh, add. Um, but essentially, the um, theory is that your confidence in your own knowledge or in your in a piece of your own knowledge, uh, your confidence in your opinion uh, is inversely proportional to your expertise. So the more you know about something, the less confident you are in your opinions. And you can probably think of many examples pertaining to other people <laughs> where this is true, and very few that pertain to yourself, uh, which is another sort of interesting aspect of it. And what was the comment you wanted to uh, make on that, Paul? <laughs> Hesitantly. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, well, like I said, it... it, it it's been very interesting how people have, have, have looked, looked at the Dunning-Kruger effect through different angles and looked at different data on it and said it might not be as accurate as what people think. It's nothing new. Those of you who attended the Mike Montaigne, Montaigne talk in 2018, it stems from there and he talks about it in, I think, an essay called Of Experience. And he talks about people having pretending to have a greater ability than what they've got. And, and, it, and we can see it all around us every day. You can see it this evening. Some of you may be thinking you're seeing it this evening. But um, you see it with politicians and everything else. Now, the, the problem I have with that, it's not a problem. The issue I have with that is that, say, like, to be a performer or an artist or a musician, you need to have a certain amount of ego and arrogance to get up there in the first place. Now, you might not be the best at what you do at a particular time, but you have to think you are to get up on stage and do it in the first place. And you have to have that incentive to get up there. Whereas if you just, if you just think, well, I'm not very good at this, you won't get up at all. So it does have its uses. It's not entirely bad. Yeah. Bit of mis misplaced self-confidence is often a very good thing. I, I agree, I agree, absolutely. I can buy into that. Um, I want to start to open things up to questions. So if you do have a question, my lovely assistant here is modeling the behavior we're looking for. Uh, hopefully you can, all, you can all see that. So raise your hand. Um, Robin often has a question, but I think you're just demonstrating here. We've got one here. <laughs> okay. And if you are online, uh, I can see we do have quite a few people uh, online. Uh, then type your question in the chat and uh, Robin will wave at us and make some other gesture uh, to be determined and we will ask him to read out your question to the audience. So I will wander around and pass the microphone. That's a comment really, it's great. It's a lovely link to the Nietzsche talk from the last time I thought where where they uh, question the value of, value of truth. Is, is it just an objective thing or is it just something we can choose? Um, but that's great. And the epistemic insouciance. I will be using this word every day from now on. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I just want to ask, uh, could you imagine if someone with those uh, qualities became the prime minister of this country or the president of the United States? Well, could, could you imagine that? <laughs> Well, it, that's it, it, yeah, that's begging the question. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, well, again, it's very interesting because the epistemic enthusiasts, in some respects, a politician does need a little bit of that to get policies through because they're against it. We sort of reversal of that the other day, but I don't want to go too political and get things thrown at me on stage. Um, but um, 
yeah and with the with the 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 Nietzschean thing I think birth the tragedy as well where it has two you mentioned it at the beginning where you have sort of like a, a Epicurean kind of view towards things where everything's fine and then a more stoic kind of attitude towards things where you take things steady and you you're not excessive and I think in life you need a mixture of both I don't think you can do one or the other if you're very flippant and very carefree as you usually are when you're young um, you can get away with doing a lot of things, but as you get older, you kind of look back on your life and you think, mm, I should have been a bit more stoic there. I should have been a little bit laid back there. So it, it's a mixture of everything. But I, I know that it is birth of tragedy, isn't it? Where he talks about the Dionysian, is it? Oh, uh, yeah, the Apollonian and Dion Dionysian. Yeah, Dion yeah. Dionysian, and he talks yeah. about that, which can also be linked to the stoicism and epicurean kind of ideas in life a little bit so yeah. sure yeah, yeah i think you know the interesting or one interesting part of that is is again this question like of what game people are playing online what language game people are playing and you know, what proportion of it is a, a rational attempt to pursue a serious line of inquiry and you know i don't i don't know about you but my conversations with my friends, for example, a relatively small percentage of that is a rational attempt to pursue a serious line of inquiry. Um, but because everything online is sort of published and is, you know, there for decades, if not forever, um, we tend to hold it to very different standards than we do everyday conversation. And I think you you mentioned, Paul, you were surprised that people will tweet anything but I, I think you know another way of looking at that is the people will say anything and you know online it happens to be that they will type it into twitter and they don't really distinguish or they don't really think of that as a, a serious publication that needs to stand the test of time and people can get into a lot of trouble when you know years or even decades later people look back at what they've tweeted and people have lost jobs uh, for such things, do you have do you have thoughts on that and how we should approach well, that, our own communication as well, well as other people? Well, that's been very important. We've looked at statements that have been issued online years ago. I mean, you can look at the Michael Gove, what he said at Oxford, pretty controversial, uh, and you can look at um, other people as well from tweets from the past. Now, the interesting thing I find about that is that in in if we go from here across the pond and back here again, is that in this country, we have a hate speech law. Now, I think it's due to the First Amendment in America. There isn't one. And so what happened was a few years ago, does anybody know about Section 230 at all? Anybody know about that? Well, there's a, there was like a law, if you like, that was passed for Section 230 on the internet. And what it did is that it took the responsibility of what was put on the internet from the internet service provider or the person providing the platform and put it on the person actually writing it on there. And there's been uh, various laws tried to be passed this year. There's a thing called Earn It, I believe, as well, which is kind of like trying to alter it. And people have gone absolutely crackers about trying to alter it and everything. Because what I find interesting with that is that, especially in America, with people holding up and saying, I have the right of freedom of speech and things like that they actually do say that and get away with it but mark zuckerberg at facebook will not take responsibility for doing it i think we had a whistleblower called hannah or was it hannah somebody the other the oh, other yeah. one she was a whistleblower said he won't take responsibility for it but the law actually passed means he doesn't have to really take responsibility for it and that's a big big problem and also in America, regarding the, the uh, uh, debates and things, because you said you had debates with friends early on, um, there's a very interesting movement that's come along with like the gaming community. I don't play games and things like that. Uh, and they, what they have actually done, they started having little chat rooms, and this has developed into full-scale debates. If there's a person called Steve Bonnell III, who's known that got the catchy name of Destiny, which is a bit catchier than Wit can sign a shirt from Schopenhauer, isn't it? And another one called Vouch who goes on there, and they have these furious debates. Some of them have got a, 
very uh, got a good grasp of philosophical and argument and rhetoric. Others haven't. Others just shout at each other. But it's interesting how that's developed. And again, you've got these some people on there who have got hundreds of thousands of subscribers and viewers and things like that. And also, if we look at how it's influenced, we have influencers on there. And influencers don't actually sell you things on there. People get loads and loads and loads and loads of likes and loads and loads of subscribers. They don't actually sell you anything. They brand themselves. So they'll put a brand on something and it makes them a fortune. I've got, I keep getting this advert up with this woman who keeps saying she keeps buying loads of authors' works and selling them on the internet. And I think, paying the royalties, you know, why don't you pay them the royalties? And it's a great way of them amassing money and things like that. But sorry, I'm rabbiting on again. Should we take a couple more mm. contributions? I think we had. Yes. First, another equation for you, which I enjoy greatly, which is the ignorance of people who are having an online debate is directly measured by the time it takes Hitler to enter the conversation ah. in terms of yes. ad hominem abuse. Um, and uh, a comment about uh, epistemic insouciance. I thought it was confirmation bias, but is it subtly different or is it the same thing? It's... It's subtly, it's subtly, it, it is different um, because it, it's kind of linked, but it's a different kind of um, aspect of it. Because sometimes what can happen with epistemic enthusiasm is that you can have somebody who's so dogmatic, they don't accept anything at all. They're just absolutely in there and you can't tell them anything. There's a confirmation bias, as you know, can affirm the thoughts and things like that. But the, this is what happens with. Like I said, Jennifer Leckie is going to go into all this with echo chambers. There is a subtle difference in there with epistemic enthusiasm and lying and confirmation bias and unconscious bias. And there are different kind of aspects to it. But yeah, people do get locked into views and locked into thinking. And we love to have a views affirmed. I mean, you can you can look at academics and the peer reviews and they're sat there going, when somebody challenges them, they're sat there going, that's a really good point, you know, I really like that. When they're really thinking, damn, I missed that point. And they're kicking themselves. I do anyway, I kick myself all the time. Um, uh, I've got very bruised shins this week. And uh, um, so it's an interesting point. But yeah, yeah, it's, they're, 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 they're closely linked, but there is a very subtle difference in there. Yeah, I, I think that's right. You know, confirmation bias is you know related a bit to the the system one system two distinction you know it's always much more pleasurable to have your opinions confirmed so you will naturally gravitate to forums where like-minded people are expressing views uh much like your own and you know i um talked a little bit a couple of years ago at one of these meetings about uh you know how we how we blame Facebook or, or the internet for a lot of the flaws that are actually our own, you know, part of, part of human nature and the internet just makes them more visible and sort of speeds them up. Um, there is a less polite term for epistemic insouciance, which I you know, thought we can, was, we can say it now Barbie's gone. Barbie's gone. Yeah. So, so we can, I'll There's let a you. Very, <laughs> very famous F, uh, essay by a philosopher, Harry, Frankfurt, wasn't it? Who who talks about you know the distinction between lying that Paul Paul drew and just having a, a disregard for the truth because you know you're not you're not looking to say something true or find out something true. You're just saying something because it will have some beneficial effect for you at that particular moment. And while we don't have you know strong political views in the club as a whole, you know you can point to politicians at the moment who might be more on that. That side of the the spectrum, um, Frank first essay was called "On Bullshit." Yes, <laughs> and he he distinguished he defined bullshit as yeah, this disregard for the truth. That's not what we're interested in. It's not that we're trying to. It's not that we know the truth and we're trying to mislead people by lying to them. It's that we have no real interest in what the truth is, and what's important at the moment is the 
effect that a particular claim can have on my supporters or my potential supporters. Well, there's also a thing called poltering as well, whereas um, politicians sort of like try and say the truth and get away with it, but omit certain uh, ideas. Clinton was a classic case with, you know, did you have sex with that woman, you know, and he like said, I'm not having sex with that woman. So he, he, he answered it in, in present tense, the question, <laughs> because the relationship had ended and totally neglected the past tense when he was in the Oval Office, whatever, looking over his papers and things, you know. Yeah, answer the question you wish you'd been asked. Yeah, so that's it. That's a, that's the a thing. And, and also, I think I've, I've got to say, because we know the phrase that comes up here as well as well we've had enough of experts is the phrase from the master the olympic gold standard of poltering michael gove who is absolutely fantastic at doing that he is a it is is a joy and frustration to watch from a language point of view because he can contort the language and twist it in so many ways that it's just it's incredible how he gets away with it well, talking of questions we wish we'd been asked, I think, Robin, you've got a few. Um, I'm only going to mention Hitler in 10 seconds. <laughs> um, you know, I gave a talk, you know, a couple of years ago on um, uh, semantics, metasemantics, ethics, metaethics, distortion, uh, commensurability between, uh, and then the fact value debate. Um, Russell, um, uh, error theory, error truth theory. How much further have we got forward, you think, now um, from the, those uh, old guys who were, um, shall we say, debating the same sort of uh, topic in terms of Arbeit macht frei, okay? Total meta ethical distortion of truth. Have we, have we moved forward from those days? I hope so. I certainly hope so. I mean, um, the idea of, you know, it's 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 quite difficult not to mention sort of the things that happened within the Holocaust and 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 things like that, and guarding back to Hitler because it's it's very very important that we do mention it for a start. I just think it's important, and when I do get the you mentioned Hitler within 10 seconds in the conversation. I said, that's good, because I normally do it in five. So I've got you five seconds, Grace, which normally works. And it's great. It's a lovely, pithy statement. It's a great, pithy statement. Um, but what happens with that is that people use it as a, as a, as a defense. They'll say, ah, you've mentioned Hitler again. You shouldn't really mention him. And I'm like, well, yeah, you should. You know, he, he was a significant figure in the 20th century. But going on about meta ethics and ethics it, it depends on um you've got a very practical view towards it robin strachan's got a very practical view towards i think the other people can talk about meta ethics and actually cure your insomnia within about seven minutes and there are some continental philosophers i don't want to get in an argument about our uh, analytical continental philosophers but the one in particular whose book i will recommend to you at the bar i won't recommend it here if you are having little problems getting to sleep just read the first chapter and you will be away absolutely fast asleep because you won't understand a word of what he's saying i actually looked at it and i turned it upside down to have a look yeah and it was it was like reading anybody remember professor stanley unwin anybody remember it was like reading unwinese and i asked another philosopher what he meant and he said oh I don't know. <laughs> I went, oh, right. That's a bit of an open thing then. So, sorry. I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> Quentin Meliso. I didn't say that. I've got a bad cough. I've got a very we, bad cough. We can edit that out. It's fine. Uh, Quentin Meliso. We have an online question uh, from Chris. Chris, do you want to try and speak to us through the internet? If not, we'll read it out. Um, can you hear me? Go for it. Can, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, greetings from sunny South Yorkshire, Paul, and thank you for a, an interesting talk. Um, I was thinking about the social function of knowledge um, and how, you know, that the internet is, seems to be all about atomized individuals. But um, one example that struck me was that, 
they interviewed some Alaskan oil workers about global warming. And what they said was, oh, well, it's all made up by the government so they can make more money. Now, I don't understand quite how that follows because they make more money by getting taxes off lots of oil. But um, be that as it may, it strikes me that that belief, whether they really believe it or not, whether they're insouciant or not, um, is necessary for them to function in that way of life. Because if you're an Alaskan ask, ask oil worker who said, well, I don't believe in all this, <laughs> we're going to destroy the planet, you know, they'd, they'd pretty much get kicked out and, and they wouldn't be talked to. So, you know, it's almost knowledge is ideology, sort of serving the interests of, of social groups, um, which I think is links in with what you said, but, but uh, not something you really emphasised. Well, the, well the, the problem is, like you say, is that if you do have a dissenting view within a group of people, you can be isolated from them. You can get isolated pretty quickly. And that works in any group, even in, in, dare I say, some of the more extreme environmental groups who can be stonewalled or ne neglected. One of the interesting aspects about groups on the internet that I've found, and I've had real, I won't give the anecdote, but I have real life experience of this, is that people will get together under the guise of being for a common cause but it isn't, it's for individual, they're each individual causes. And it's just pure coincidence that they all get together at the same time. And this happens with um, traffic calming measures in Chiswick, for example, is a great example of that one, where people get together and, and will protest, or, or, protest or, or, or go to the council and say things. But when somebody else has got a problem, they're kind of like, no, that's not nothing to do with me. And I find that pretty weird because I'm, I'm four people banding together in communities, no matter how insignificant an issue might be. Because it can just lead on to other things. It can lead on to local government or other people getting away with things that you wouldn't recognise. And then it comes around to, it's like the old Robert thingy poem, you know, first they came for the, you know, first they came for the councillors and then nobody was there. And then they came for the bin men and they'd all gone and working, driving lorries for Sainsbury's and then they came for the, so you have to be very careful with groups online. And you also have to be very careful because there's some very, very, very crafty and great rhetoricians out there who can really pull you in if you're not careful. I mean, some really clever ones. Um, there's a chap in America who I quite find very hilariously funny called Stefan Molyneux, who actually, he wrote a book about arguing and got unsound and sound arguments and, uh, um, what's the other one? Uh, unsound and sound arguments the wrong way around. So it was fantastic, his opening chapter. He actually managed to write an opening chapter that contradicted itself, which was quite amazing. Not the first philosopher to do that, I suspect. <laughs> Guilty. Um, we're coming to the end. We do have time for a couple more questions or comments from the audience, if anyone would like to. No, I think we've come to anything online, Robin? No, okay. Oh, yes, Brian. <laughs> um, some, some years ago, there was a series of booklets put out by organizations that had very firm beliefs. Um, or what, and there, there, there was a, the series was called Objections To. And these were objections to the very beliefs that the individuals endorsed. So there was Objections to Christianity, written by Christians. Objections to Judaism or atheism, written by that. And I thought these were wonderful books because they really picked out the weaknesses and people should be interested in the weaknesses and the alternatives to their point of view. And in some ways it actually strengthened their point of view because it showed they'd taken on board what the objections and alternative views were. Now, it seems to me the joy in being a maverick and being contrary, which is a joy that means a lot to me, let me tell you, <laughs> um, has, has, been, has been driven out of much of modern discourse in the idea that, you know, you're going to win if you just get very insistent. 
But history shows that your personal insistence doesn't get you very far. Far better to listen carefully to the best of your opponent and then steal it from them. Well, there is a very good, I had an, I had an, an email from many years ago from Christopher Hitchens. And I, I, I asked him how he was successful. I, um, and I was mainly talking about the trial of Henry Kissinger, but and he just said, research, 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 and P.S. Paul, research. And he said, just know your subject. And when you're going into, and this is kind of like linked into what you said, um, is that when you're going into a, into a debate, know your opponent's argument as well as your own, if not more so, which is a good tactic, which is kind of linked in with you because you're getting somebody who knows the topic to actually question it themselves which I think is more inviting for some people to actually have a look at it and raise some of the questions and to look at some of the questions slightly differently than sort of like a, a dare I say, a predatory atheist, rather than dare I say, Richard Dawkins, who always, always, shall we say, very staunch on some of his views and, and quite entertaining when he slips out of biology and when he gives some views on other things, not religion, but other views, it can be quite entertaining. Let me put it that way. Very good. Are there any last comments or questions? Uh, great. Well, um, before we uh, stop and thank Paul, I, I would just like to mention our next talk, uh, which is coming up, checks notes, uh, Tuesday the 14th of December. So that is... Yeah, I think that's still the second Tuesday of the month, um, by my calculations. Yeah. Well, we shall see. We shall consult our COVID handbook and see if we're allowed to do anything uh, even more festive than listen to Professor Glazebrook uh, or Trisha, friend of the club, who she is now. Trish. 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 Even closer friend of the club. Uh, from Washington State University. She's a professor there also has posts in Texas and Lagos, Nigeria. Um, and she is actually going to be visiting in person. Uh, I hasten to, to say this wasn't um, funded entirely by Barnes Philosophy Club. We are putting, putting her up uh, locally, uh, but she happily uh, is going to be in the UK anyway. So we thought we'd um, borrow her for a talk. Uh, so she's going to be talking about a topic that was touched on, actually, in uh, one of the questions, uh, climate change and climate denial as part of our season on consciousness and technology. So that should be quite fun, I think, Paul. What do you think? Trish is, is, is excellent. I first met Trish a few years ago now. at a, uh, It was at a Heidegger conference <laughs> in Brighton. And she's written some good books on Heidegger as well, but she's very, very good. And uh, you'll enjoy your talk because she's um, a fantastic philosopher and one of my, one of my favourite philosophers who I like to listen to about the environment. So, and the question should be quite interesting to her because yeah. she's very thorough in her answers. So have a good, <laughs> good discussion about climate change. And also, if you've been saving up any questions on Heidegger, please do hold them over. Uh, for next month when we will ask Trish to tackle them. Um, so let's wrap up there. And can we just say a huge thank you uh, for all the preparation that went into the recording, uh, as well as the questions and uh, all the contributions that we've had from Paul to the club in lots and lots of ways. So thank you, Paul. And finally, a huge thank you to all of you for coming. I hope to see you next month for some climate change and or denial chat. <laughs> yes, if it's not too hot or cold. Yeah.